Doctor? Uh, Mr. Mister. Mister. Just Bob. Mr. Just Bob. 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 My college and the University of Montana gave an honorary doctorate, I think, two years ago. That's oh. right. That's right. And Ron also arranged to have Governor Schweitzer just hop, happen to pop in at a social the day before, and so I got to meet the governor, and uh, that was special of Ron and the faculty to arrange a surprise drop-in visit by Governor Brian Schweitzer. Great. And I'm very happy he's here because um, I wasn't sure we were going to have a third speaker this morning, and because I'd ask people and they'd say, oh, I don't feel qualified, oh, I'll talk to this person, this person was going to be gone. Finally, somebody recommended Bob much, and he said, yes, I'd be happy to. So thank you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Doreen. We'll addressing the 1910 fire history. Well, yeah, I guess we're playing hide and seek around the posts here, but I'll try and move a little bit so I can have eye contact with some of you some of the time. Anyway, uh, you know, I can't believe Doreen's good fortune and other sponsors of this teacher workshop to have it fall in this auspicious year. How incredible is it to have a fire teacher workshop conference in the year 2010? And I don't know if anyone's recognized the fact yet, but today is also known as and it gives me shivers to think of this too, 9-11. And uh, so 1910 gives me shivers once in a while as well. Here we are, 100 years later, commemorating and honoring the victims and survivors of the 1910 forest fires that ripped eastern Washington, northern Idaho, and western Montana on two days August 20th and 21st, 1910. And it's pretty amazing. This is my 50 some years in fire, fire research and fire management. I've heard of the 1910 fires forever and ever. I was one of those BRC, blister rust camp, Ribes pullers that Ron Wakamoto talked about earlier in 1953. So that's 47 years plus 10. I guess that's 57 years. And I feel fortunate to be upright, still breathing, <laughs> and able to bring you a message that has been indelibly imprinted on me like that fire environment Dick talks about has been imprinted on creatures like the black back. I think I've had my black back imprinted with fire ever since 1953. And I feel fortunate to have survived, a fire survivor to this day, to share this story with you, or part of the story that Ron and Dick and Sue started. And I'm gonna be looking in a little detail at the 1910 fires with you. I have two objectives or purposes in mind. I want to, as I said a moment ago, commemorate and honor the lives of both the victims and the survivors of the 1910 fires. It's extremely important. This is the fourth time I've given this presentation, so I should get it right today. Uh, I have two more to go, one on September 24th and one on, uh, uh, well, I guess I have, uh, yeah, and, and another one in October. So um, each time I learn something, and I adapt and modify the program based on what I learn. I always learn something from Dick Hutto, and in a little bit you'll learn what I learned from Dick Hutto today as he gave his presentation just a few moments ago. But the second thing I wanna do, as important as it is to honor the victims and survivors of 1910, it's equally as important that we bring their stories and the lessons learned up to 2010. I think it's appropriate that we ask ourselves in this next little bit some challenging questions, three questions in fact, that we'll get to in just a little bit. How well have we learned the lessons of, of 1910? Have we learned and applied them well? I sometimes wonder as I see the town of Boulder, Colorado 
once more, imperiled by fire, over 100 homes destroyed. And we only have to go back 21 years to 1989, the Black Tiger Fire, I think it was, Ron. 44 homes were destroyed. It was the first major wildland urban interface fire that took property out at that level. 21 years later, you know, what have we learned? Have we learned anything at all? Where are fire resistant families that are as compatible as that black backed woodpecker that's learned to live in this fire environment? Where are those lessons learned from the Black Tiger Fire in Boulder in 1989 that might have kept people out of harm's way in a fire environment? where it's not a question of if these fires will burn, only when. And we know enough now over all these hundred years on how to prepare the homeowner, the resident, to live in that environment no matter what the nature of the fire in a more compatible way. I'm so pleased to be talking with teachers because sometimes I get a little impatient with adults, not you adults, <laughs> because you're the ones that are conditioning the minds of our future decision makers. But sometimes I think, like looking at Boulder on TV the last few nights, I think, why don't the adults get it? They had the lessons learned in 1989. Why don't they prepare their home to be fire safe? What's going on? And sometimes I think it's important to back up to those minds that are still impressionable, that are still open, the minds of your students, and share with them a compatible, cohesive story about fire that tells it in all of its aspects, as, just, as Dick just gave us a vignette of, uh, that fire is a part and parcel of who we are, where we live, what we do, and the plants and animals that we enjoy. And to be able to give that message to students and give it to them so well that they might go home to their parents up in the, in the Black Mountain area, the parents who have done nothing since the Black Mountain fire, and say, hey, you know, we learned in school today. Point, 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 point. And, and that's a remarkable opportunity for all of us. So we're going to talk about the 1910 fire. It was more about survival on August 20th and 21st, not suppression. There was little suppression going on that day, although there were people out there trying. It was a lost cause by the afternoon of September, uh, of August 20th. Uh, in fact, it was such a lost cause as it looked to Ranger Ed Pulaski, who lived in Wallace, Idaho, and was an early Forest Service Ranger, when he said goodbye to his wife and daughter the afternoon and early evening of August 20th, 1910, he said, Emma, I may never see you again. And he came so close to living that prophecy that it's unbelievable. So we're going to look at what happened then. We're going to talk and bring it up to the present day through what that meant in terms of fire exclusion. Ron went down through the policies. Some of those policies stuck in place way too long because they were not very responsive. They were a knee-jerk reaction in 1910, and we lived with them practically forever. And finally, uh, slowly, we're getting out of that mode. Then we're gonna look at some, we're gonna look at some lessons learned. So the players, how many of you read Timothy Egan's book, The Big Burn? Boy, if you have, and I hope you do, I devoured that book early in the summer, preparing for these presentations, but also informing myself better. And I certainly wasn't disappointed. On the jacket, it says he's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And that certainly comes through loud and clear. He breathed life into what was going on before during and after 1910. So who are the players? Here's Teddy Roosevelt in his bully pulpit, telling it like he is. The only story he ever could tell was telling it like it is. And he had an important message for the American people. It was a message that's meaningful to each and every one of us in this room. It was the importance of starting on a path towards conservation that considered all aspects of ecosystems as an integral part of our upbringing, our culture, our welfare, and our society in the United States. He hung out with some very interesting people like uh, 
this long whiskered guy here, John Muir, in front of one of the big trees in Yosemite National Park. So T.R. and John Muir were more than casual acquaintances. Who were some of the Forest Service leaders? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt appointed Gifford Pinchot from another famous family as the first chief of the Forest Service. He later was fired by President Taft in some very interesting politics, all entwined with this idea of conservation in the United States. And Egan brings that out very well. Uh, Ron talked about this gentleman, Ellers Koch. You're going to get, or you have already gotten, that wonderful book, his memoirs, When the Mountains Roared. When this picture was taken, he was the forest supervisor of this forest where we're meeting right now. He was the forest supervisor of the Lolo National Forest. Someone told me this summer when they saw this picture that he liked to have his picture taken on a horse. So I guess maybe that was part of his leadership aura that uh, like five stars on a general's collar, I guess his big rangy horse gave him some kind of added uh, impetus in his work. But he was a major player at those times. So yes, he was supervisor here. I'm afraid maybe Sue, I don't know, maybe this will be better on this side. So another big player at that time was this gentleman, Edward Pulaski. Here he is in front of the mine tunnel where he saved most of his crew from burning to death. Uh, his heroic, heroic actions were unbelievably successful under trying, trying circumstances. And uh, he, he uh, began with the Forest Service just two years earlier in the 1910 at the age of 40. And he invented, uh, how many of you are familiar with a Pulaski firefighting tool? I mean, every firefighter in the United States is they put their hands, at least I do, as you grip a Pulaski, and I still do it on my property up the West Fork of the Bitterroot. I'm reminded of this legacy that Ed Pulaski left with us. Here's another famous forester out of Washington State University. He saved his crew and lived to read his own obituary. How many people can do that? He was so remote in that remote country, it took them a week to find him. You read the story in Egan's book. It's an amazing account of how through his tenaciousness, he saved his crew, but he was so far off the beaten track where they finally survived that it wasn't until a week later where someone hiked in to his location thinking that he would find bodies and he found the entire crew intact and alive. So if you read Ellers Koch's book, you'll read this account where if you start up there in northern Idaho by Clark's Fork, Idaho, and fly on a southeast azimuth towards Moose Creek Ranger Station. It's a path of about 160 miles. And over that 160 miles flight, you will be over the 1910 fire 70% of the time, with the fire extending 25 miles on either side of that flight line. And what you would have seen on that kind of a flight would still have been only 70% of the entire area burned. It burned 3 million acres in eastern Washington, northern Idaho, western Montana, primarily on two days under very strong winds, August 20th and 21st. And it's kind of akin to burning the entire state of Connecticut in two days, a massive, massive bunch of fires all whipped together. Estimates vary as to how many free burning fires there were. The 1910 fire was not one fire, it's plural, the 1910 fires. Because with hardly any access in the backcountry, no detection system, very poor lookouts, very few people, each ranger having a patrol area of a measly 670 square miles, there were anywhere from 1,700 to approaching 3,000 free burning fires when those winds hit. An unbelievable extent of fires in the landscape waiting for tornado-like winds. So what was the state of the Forest Service back then? As I said, all of these things were common 
at that time. We were only five, what, five years old? Five years old in 1910. We were formed by Teddy Roosevelt, Forest Service was, in 1905. August 8, President Taft activated 1,600 soldiers, 1,650 from here at Fort Missoula and, and Fort George Wright to go to the, go to the fires. Um, the 25th Infantry, the Buffalo Soldiers, a black infantry composed of two companies did remarkable service in the towns of Avery and Wallace helping keep the damage and the destruction from being more serious. And by season's end, there were 10,000 people, 10,000 men in those days on the fire lines. There's the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, 25th Infantry, wonderful uh, performance as observed by everyone. One company assigned to Wallace, the other company assigned to Avery. Uh, what's, what was our firefighting capability like then? It was not much. There, the uh, 1908 fire season was a serious one, not like 1910, but we got some experience fighting fires in 1908. Rangers were our only skilled firefighters. None of the crews had any firefighting experience. They were mostly conscripted people off the streets, miners or, or what have you, people out of work people out of the bars, people out of Skid Row were conscripted and made up uh, many of these crews. Average patrol area, 60, 670 square miles. We were spread a little bit thin. Uh, none of the crew members had fought fire, generally 12 to 10, 20 people on a crew. And there you see the array of hand tools that those crews brought to bear on this three million acres of fire. Now here's what I learned from Dick Hutto today. For those of us who have been in fire for a long time, we keep needing to get Dick's reminder uh, not to use uh, subjective laden terms for fire. Uh, I think this use of the term here is okay because I think the 1910 fires epitomized Webster's Dictionary of a wildfire being a highly destructive fire in the sense that those fires, as they burned into Wallace the evening of August 20th, 1910, they destroyed one third of Wallace, Idaho, a destructive fire. It completely disrupted people's homes and their lives and fortunately killed no one in the town of Wallace. But as we go through these next scenes, this is where I wished I'd changed the word and I knew it was too late to change it. <laughs> and I'm thinking of the word destruction and uh, a better word here I think would have been that more, no matter where you were in the 1910 fires, the mortality, the vegetation mortality was rather complete. And destruction is a value judgment. Jick has just shown us with many slides and a lot of research data appropriately that these fires, other, not, other than being destructive to people's lives and their homes, were a part and parcel of how these forests evolved and how they will one day burn. And you cer certainly couldn't make the case in 1910 that fire exclusion had led to some unbelievable and unnatural fuel accumulation. Nothing could be further from the truth because we'd only been in the process of fighting fire for a few short and very naive years. But this is what the forest looked like near Falcon, Idaho, right after the 1910 fires. This is what it looked like at Big Creek near Avery. This is what it looked like on this forest, the Lolo National Forest. The images are complete. To me, they look like a cookie cutter, Dick. It looks like you stamped out one, one burned area after another, all based on the same model, all based on the same image, all based on the same carbon copy. They all look the same. And, and when I see large fires, uh, when I see large fires in, uh, in my 
57 years since 1953, even in the most highly intense fires, I'm used to seeing a mosaic pattern. I'm used to seeing a, a pattern of burned vegetation, unburned vegetation, or moderately or lightly burned vegetation based on the variation in fire behavior due to fuels, weather, and topography. And uh, this didn't show that kind of mosaic. Even Yellowstone in 1988, when you saw aerial shots of Yellowstone in big, long runs of hot, high intensity fires in mostly lodgepole pine, there was a mosaic pattern still in Yellowstone National Park. But the patches of this kind of scene were large and were within the historical range of variability. So here's the Pulaski Tunnel. That's the entrance to that tunnel. Unbelievable burning outside that tunnel through that late afternoon, evening, and the early next morning. Pulaski knew of this tunnel based on his experience. He had a crew of 50 people, and they had two horses. And he finally had everybody take refuge in this tunnel that's just two miles up Placer Creek outside the town of Wallace, Idaho. And he had them in there, and you can imagine no, you can't imagine. You can't imagine the noise that this fire would have made burning at that intensity. It's a, it's a sound that's been likened by firefighters trapped in fire shelters or in safety zones as the roar of jet planes overhead or the roar of a freight train going right past in front of the firefighter. An unbelievable, scary, frightening sound so he had his 50 people and two horses in that, in that mine shaft. And some of them finally got to the point of panic, not surprisingly, attempted to leave and run out. And you know the story, or some of you do. He drew a revolver, stood at the entrance to the mine inside, and said the next person who attempts to leave is going to be shot and not another person. They were more afraid of Ed Pulaski and his revolver than they were and what that terrible sound was outside. And, and they stayed, and most of them became unconscious during the night, probably due to oxygen dep deprivation, as this kind of burning was consuming oxygen in front of the mine shaft, sucking oxygen out of the mine shaft. They awoke maybe four or five in the morning to discover that five of the 50 had died and one of the two horses had died. But surprisingly, 45 people lived barely to see another day. And the account of Egan's book is unbelievable as these people left that mine, went out to Placer Creek that's running. I was there on May 20th of this year on a field trip. Placer Creek runs right in front of that mine shaft. And they went, they were terribly thirsty, as you might imagine, deprived of water for 10, 12 hours or more, extremely hot conditions. And the Placer Creek was so filled with ash and so warm from the fire that it was not drinkable. And they stumbled the two miles down Placer Creek towards safety in Wallace, with Pulaski being practically blinded and many of the men injured from what they had just endured. An unbelievable, and this is how it looks today, and if you're ever in Wallace, drive the couple miles out of town, take the two mile walk, the Forest Service is done, it's an unbelievably well laid out trail, well signed, a wonderful story, and I think anyone in this room who's dealing with children and fire history and fire ecology, someday you need to put your own boots on that trail and have a look for yourself at how that country has recovered in the last 100 years. In fact, Steve Pine was on the walk with me, the fire historian who wrote another book about 1910. And I walked along the trail with him for a bit. I know him well, he's a good friend. I said, Steve, you've been here several times before as you wrote your 1910 book. And he said, yes, Bob, I have. And the first two times I came in trying to find this mine shaft, I couldn't find it because the trail 
was non-existent and the area was so grown up with that North Idaho brush that I could hardly even walk, let alone find the mine shaft. Well, the Idaho Panhandle National Forest has done the hard work to make that trail accessible for all of us today. Suppression footnotes, the big wind, fires burn towards the Bitterroot, they burn west towards the St. Mary's Court Lane, Spokane country, uh, some big disasters in many places, 18 men died in a cabin at Big Creek. An unbelievable story, again, a story I'll never forget from Timothy Egan, it's a story of Pinky Adair. She grew up in North Idaho, her father raised her to be an unbelievable outdoors woman and horsewoman. And she was conscripted by the Forest Service to cook in a remote fire camp for firefighters. When things really went to hell in a handbasket, she decided it was time to get out. And she <laughs> hit the trail, walked 30 miles through that kind of country, just preceding this fire blowing into a place like Avery, Idaho, got to Avery, caught the last, the last train out of Avery, every seat and every standing room only spot, all those places were taken on the train and she was told, you can climb the ladder and leave Avery on the roof of one of these railroad cars. Talk about late evacuation and she did that. And uh, she lived to an old age all of that time in North Idaho, and it's an amazing story of perseverance. Two, of, two Italian young men came to the United States to work in mines to, to earn money for their families back in Northern Italy. Uh, Domenico Bruno and Giacomo Vittoni, and uh, 24 and 27, they took refuge in Joe Beauchamp's homestead root cellar, and Seven people were in that root cellar, and those seven people burned to death in that root cellar. And they burned so death to, they burned so badly that when rescuers came into the site, you know, they couldn't make heads or tails of who was whom because of the severity of the burning. And finally, after two years of trying really hard by people on behalf of these two Italian firefighters, $200 was sent by the US government to Bruno's parents for his death. We can do better than that for our victims. Well, you know, I, I use Webster's Dictionary of Destruction of these fires. It fits in this case, too. 78 firefighters had their lives destroyed by the 1910 fires or fire-related incidents of the 1910 fire. Uh, Coeur, d Coeur d'Alene, um, 72 firefighters died, four in the Cabinet National Forest, two in the Ponderay for a total of 78. And citizen, oh, two did die in Wallace, one in Taft, one a, a St. Joe prospector died in the St. Joe National Forest area, and three Newport homesteaders died. Four, a total of seven civilians, 78 firefighters, or 85 people. I was at this sobering moment in St. Mary's, as I told you, on August 20th of this year, just a short while ago. And a large number of people turned out on that sunny day to hear a lot of different speakers and to see the cemetery and the memorial to the fallen firefighters rededicated. And that's the new plaque that, that sculpture in stone is intended to represent a flame, 1910 to 2010, in honor of the fallen firefighters of the 1910 fires, rededicated August 20th, 2010. And 57 of those fallen firefighters had their bodies reinterred at this cemetery many years ago. And towns and places were destroyed in Idaho, a third of Wallace, Grand Forks, and Falcon. And you can see those locations in Montana that were either seriously damaged or destroyed by the 1910 fire. A serious, serious time in our history. The chief forester, Henry Graves in Washington in 1913 said, you know, make no doubt about it, and you can read his quotes, but in, in essence, as Ron showed in his policy slide, 
The name of the game after 1910 was for the Forest Service and largely for other federal agencies as well, was that fire exclusion was the only game in town. We were not going to have a balanced fire management program. We were not going to put our chips in a, a couple baskets, prescribed fire and wildfire. We were going to devote almost our entire budget and our people and other resources to suppressing fire in the forest. So that's, that was our fire exclusion legacy. He showed the 1910 policy. It went from 35 to 78. Every fire in the forest was a bad fire. We were going to organize to put it out by 10 AM the next day. That lit up to 1935. And then certainly from 35 to 78, it was reaffirmed. And sometimes the Forest Service needs to get a nudge from outside the agency to head in a different direction. This is what the Missoulian said in a headline on August 21st, 2000, as 73 homes were burning in the Bitterroot in a very difficult fire season. Menace in waiting after the historic fires of 1910, policies designed to protect forests produce thicker timber stands that burn bigger and hotter when wildfire strikes. Now again, we can go back to Dick Huddle and say, well, it's bigger and hotter. What's so bad about that? You know, that might be good for the black back and other creatures that it has co-evolved with. But when you think about people and their lives and homes and the wildland urban interface, uh, there was obvious reason to do something different with fire over the years. I'm so impressed, Dick and Ron, that finally imaginative forest on the Kootenai National Forest got it quite a few years ago. People like George Curtis and Ron Vizdak wrote prescriptions to have the high intensity stand replacement crown fire in Lodgepole Pine Forest on the Kootenai because that's how those forests evolved. It took us a while to get there, but we have some people. And even white bark pine, and I see prescribed burning in white bark pine on the Kootenai and the Bitterroot perhaps on the Lola at high elevation, late in the year, prescribing high intensity fires, because that's part and parcel of the white bark pine story. And I wish Dick had had time to tell us a little bit more of that vignette too. So that's one headline. The very next day in the Missoulian, reality, intense blazes of 2000 may be wake up to re return fire to the forest. To bring it along year after year, not save it all up, and then, like letting the genie out of the bottle all at once, quite by accident, we could be a part of that release through our more balanced fire program. Very interesting story. Uh, this is wildfire acres burned in 11 west, western states on federal ownerships. You can see this spike in 1919, 3 million acres burned. Then for many years, we. Uh, we worked hard to do what Henry Graves said we should do in 1913 and banish fire from the forest. Didn't quite get there, but until the mid-1980s, we were making fire in these western states on all federal ownerships pretty uh, insignificant compared to what it had been in the past. And then I kind of marked the change to 1985. It was the drought year. It was the year, I think, that the drought started to set in for us. And then it keeps climbing and climbing. I wish I had the years. They're available from 05 to, to 2009. But those spikes go up around 6 and 7 million acres. We can't keep fire out of the forest forever. Why aren't we part of Mother Nature and working to have a more balanced program? First question to ask, or ask ourselves, can a 1910 fire situation happen again? Jerry Williams answered that question or tried to with his approach to megafires in, at the Wallace Conference last May. And here is uh, Jerry Williams. He lives in Missoula, Montana, was the fire director. He was a fire management officer on this forest at Sealy Lake uh, at one time, went on to fire director for the region and then fire director for the country. So let's look at that question a little bit. What happened in 1910? Then, then, 
<laughs> then, it was my time over, Doreen. <laughs> we had many free burning fires. We had 1,700. I must be. We had a prolonged drought, which has been well described already this morning. A serious, serious drought. High temperatures, strong winds, logging slash that contributed somewhat. What about now? I think the big plus now, with our good detection, aerial and ground, good communication system, lots of people looking at the forest all the time, uh, I think it's very unlikely to have 1,700 free burning fires at one time in the forest because we're going to find them and, and do something about more of those than was done in 1910. We will have prolonged drought. You know, we have global climate change uh, everywhere in our discussion today as a society. And we can point to data, hard data, that come from people like Tom Swettenham at the Tree Ring Lab, at the University of Arizona, showing that fire seasons are longer and hotter than they were in the past, giving more opportunity for fires to burn to larger size, greater intensity as the forests continue to dry out over the course of a long, long summer. We have high temperatures, goes without saying. Um, we have strong winds, unbelievably strong winds. They're not going to go away. In some forest types, like Dick's 8 or 9 percent to 15 percent, we have unnatural fuel buildups, and we have to recognize that's not everywhere. But I will say, and, and I'd like to have the discussion one on one with Dick sometime, that even in Lodgepole Pine, a fire regime that's characterized mostly, like in Yellowstone, at 250 year intervals, maybe the Kootenai at 100 year intervals of infrequent high intensity crown fires with maybe a smattering of mixed fires in that intervening period of time. But I think if we could be successful at fire exclusion, putting out those new stars in Lodgepole when we can, we're, we're blurring the mosaic of age classes. And I think an age class mosaic in Lodgepole gives us a, a, a handle on maybe maintaining and sustaining some kind of fire behavior mosaic that instead of having 250 to 500,000 acres in some future fire all go up at the highest of intensities, we're going to have old age Lodgepole, middle age Lodgepole, young age Lodgepole will give us a diversity of age classes, give us a diversity of species, and it'll give us a diversity of life forms from grass to shrubs to trees. And I think all those things are healthy. And declining forest health. And again, that's pointed at that forest health situation at lower elevation. But I think at some point in the future, there are some subtle changes that might make it a little bit different at higher elevations as well. We're bringing up all this older age lodgepole and the mountain pine beetle is eating us alive from British Columbia to Colorado. People living in wildlands at large numbers. So that is a serious, serious thing that we have now and we did not have in 1910. Doreen, can I ask you a question since there's no clock in this room? What time is it? Oh, there's a clock. OK. So I still have a couple minutes. You sure do. Thanks for pointing out the clock. I didn't have eyes in the back of my head, but now I know where to look. So this, this last point here, we're going to come back to the wildland urban interface. But this is what Jerry Williams said about megafires. We're going to go through it very quickly. Megafires are those large fires that are occurring in the United States today. We'll, um, that are practically impossible to control until the weather changes or the fuels or topography change in such a dramatic way that we have a chance to be successful. IA stands for initial attack fires. 95% of the total fires that start, wildfires, are attacked successfully and kept at small size at less than 10 acres. That's our initial attack success. And you would look at that figure as a teacher and say, oh my god, let's give the wildland fire agencies a gold star. 
let's give them an A in their fire management work because they're so successful. They got a 95 over many, many years on the test. Well, 95% is nothing to be very proud of when it comes to fire management. EIA stands for Extended Initial Attack. That's only 4% of the total number of wildland fires. Extended Initial Attack is where that initial force wasn't successful and the fire escapes. Like the Storm King fire in Colorado that escaped initial attack in 1910. Before that was over, 14 of our finest lay dead and burned to death. Nine from one Prineville hotshot crew. In the Ochoco National Forest in Oregon. Smoke jumpers from McCall, Idaho, and yes, Missoula, Montana, Don Mackey, and two BLM Hell attack crew members. These are our finest firefighters, and they're trained to the greatest extent, and they have the most experience. And 14 died in early July 1994 outside Glenwood Springs, Colorado. You can go there in Glenwood Springs. If you're ever going by there on I 70, drive off for a moment and stop, and look up the cemetery and see the very touching memorial to the falling fi fallen firefighters. 70% of our fatalities on fires, wildfires, occur in that 4% of the fires because there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot that isn't known. There isn't good intelligence. The fires escape. It might have happened at night. There's spot fires everywhere. People don't know where it is. They don't, haven't put their act together yet. People are very vulnerable. And unless those people are extremely, extremely alert and vigilant, they're in great harm's way. The LF stands for large fire. That's 1% of our total fires. MF is the mega fire, one-tenth of 1% of all of our wildfires. In other words, look at those statistics at the lower right-hand corner. 1.1% of our total wildfires contribute to 95% of the total acres burned in the United States and contribute to 85% plus or minus of the total suppression cost. 1.1%. That's why I say we do not deserve an A on our report card. And that's going to continue. Second question, 100 years later, is our evacuation only interface strategy outdated Cedar Fire, San Diego County, October 2003, the Cedar Fire, 15 people, all civilians, were dead as this fire spread more quickly on Santa Ana winds than the law enforcement could get evacuation warnings out to the people in front of that fire. People were, and the fire burned through communities north of Lakeside, California, and near Alpine at 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning. It was pitch black outside with no warning. And in those households where men sometimes have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, that was happening in the path of this cedar fire in some households. And the man looked out the window and he thought, oh my God, the fire, there's a fire in my front yard. And he woke up his family in the middle of the night, said, come on now, we got to leave. And those that made the right turns in their vehicle lived. Those that made the wrong turns drove into flames in the middle of the night and died. It was a horrible story. A horrible story. One uh, couple that I know, been married 23 years, had that same incident at their home in this area. And Steve Shacklett, six foot five inch, likable, construction engineer, had Irish wolfhounds that he bred, raised, and trained to show. He and his wolfhounds got in an RV and drove one way. His partner got in her car and drove the other way, made a right turn instead of his left turn. 
She finally found a home, refuged in a home, and survived. They later found Steve Shacklett's body along with his two Irish wolfhounds burned to death in the back of his truck in his RV. And from Australia to the United States, late evacuation kills more people, probably, than anything else in the interface. When a wildfire threatens, how many of you live in a wildland urban interface? There's a few. I have a cabin that I meant to, that I've just finished building in the Bitterroot that I intend to stay in the fin because I think it's bomb proof. And if it's not bomb proof, I have a plan B. And then I have a plan C. And uh, I will stay and defend my property. But we have three options. And all the, the first two options are really good. First option is prepare your property. Everybody has the responsibility to prepare their property in advance of subsequent fire season. Our governor says it very well. He said it in spring of 2009, and he just said it again in spring of 2010. He said, with a comment directed at some of you, the resident of the interface, saving your family and your home is your responsibility. No one else is going to do it for you. When we have a very high to extreme fire danger, fire department won't be at your home. They'll be stretched so thin, they'll hardly be able to keep up with a handful of the homes that are getting engaged by fire. So it's up to you to do the right thing for you, your family, and your property. Or we can prepare our property and stay and defend. Oop. Or we can wait until the fire front arrives and leave at the last moment. And that's the last thing we want to do. People that do that, unfortunately, too often are dead, both here and in Australia. Steve Pine had a great quote in his book, Year of the Fire. The train dashing in Missoula through countryside deeply burning and over bridges and ties already aflame and with heat peeling the paint off the wooden cars. He was describing late evacuation in 1910. It's something we come by honestly. We have a heritage and a legacy of late evacuation that goes back to 1910. Imagine that. Imagine Pinky O'Dear on the roof of one of those trains, no less, somehow surviving as the paint is peeling off the last trains out of Wallace and Avery for safety in Missoula and Spokane. Late evacuation kills people. This is the Cedar Fire that we've just been talking about. Southern California, San Diego County, 2003, winds blowing Santa Ana style, 35, 45, 50 miles an hour. Desert humidities brought along with those winds down in the single, single digits, 2 to 3 percent. Fine fuel moisture, 3 to 5 percent. These people are fleeing the Cedar Fire. But as I've looked at this picture time and time again, I ask myself this question. What are those drivers seeing in their rear view mirror that makes that in their windshield <laughs> look better? My God, it's a wonder, Ron, we didn't kill several right there, right there on that panic jammed highway. Certainly paint must be getting peeled or at least highly heated, especially the black body vehicles as these people are trying to get out way, way too late. But more comments. This is the third question. Remember three questions. This is a test now, but it's an open book test. And I know you're all going to pass. Number one question, can 1910 happen again? Number two question, do we have an outmoded interface strategy? Since 1910, here 100 years later, the number three question, can we manage wildland fires to achieve multiple objectives. Those multiple objectives, and I see Dick, Dick shaking his head up and down, it includes some of his objectives that he's talked about so clearly and so well with us. Bud Moore, God bless his soul, I don't know. How, how many people know Bud Moore? 
but we in the fire profession think he's a, a visionary. We think he's highly imaginative. We think he's immortal. Although I learned this past year that up at his place, at, he calls it Coyote Acres in the Swan Valley, that he manages sustainably. He's carrying on a valiant battle against cancer. He may be 93, going on 94. And, uh, but he said, he said this in Stan Cohen and Don Miller's book, The Big Burn. In The Big Burn Smoky Aftermath, the Forest Service and companion agencies launched programs to banish fires from the forest. We've already talked about that. That has bad, bad consequences. It did have. It took us a long time to learn the lesson. Then he went on to say, though, in this very same summary to that book written in 1978, getting close. I know Doreen's getting a little antsy back there, but we're getting there, Doreen. Fire need no longer be viewed as an enemy to be banished at all times, in all places. This guy has a lot of wisdom. He never went past teachers the eighth grade, but when he retired from the Forest Service, in 1974, that spring, as Ron could attest to, he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree in forestry at the University of Montana for his vision and his wisdom and his resource management ethic. He says, instead, it should be managed to complement the objectives sought on the land this is our first prescribed natural fire in wilderness, allowed to burn, as Ron said, as an exception to the 10 a.m. policy. Not much of a fire to look at. Burned in a shrub field. Burned in August of 1972, one month, one month after the chief approved the plan to allow some lightning fires to burn. Went out at four acres, not much bigger than what you see. Four, went out at, uh, at less than uh, one tenth acre at about 24 feet by 24 feet in size. But then we've made some progress. This picture was taken August 12, 2005, 812 in the evening. The program has matured all of the Selway Bitter Wilderness, all of the Frank Church Wilderness, all of most other large wildernesses in the West, all, all of most large national parks have a program to allow, to allow lightning fires to burn. Here we see from the Hell's Half Acre lookout on that day with pretty vigorous fire weather. You can see those wind-driven fires. You can see the flag. Those are not benign fire weather conditions. The haystack, and I still call them prescribed natural fires, Ron, because that's what we called them then. Hell's Half Acre fire, the Beaver Jack fire, and the Gabe Creek fire, four fires are freely burning. And what we've learned over the last 30-some years in allowing fires to burn the Selway Bitterroot under all kinds of weather conditions from low to moderate to very high to extreme, we have an unbelievable mosaic of fire patterns on the landscape. And what we're discovering is that the prior fires to these that already have their footprint on the land downwind from these fires are going to regulate the spread, size, and intensity of these fires. It's Mother Nature's way. I'm sure that's how Mother Nature operated over vast landscapes for a long period of time. And it's interesting to see that happen. Southern California wildfires, 23 total wildfires. Texas and Oklahoma, how many of you knew that 25 people, firefighters and civilians, died in Texas and Oklahoma in 05 and 06 due to grass fires? Grass fires. The fatalities are tragic. Here are 16 of the people that died on the Southern California fires of 2003. Ron went to school right near where the tunnel fire burned in the Oakland Hills, 1991. His professor, Harold Bil Biswell, predicted that there would be a terrible fire in the Oakland, Oakland Berkeley Hills because we planted eucalyptus from Australia there, probably, in my view, the world's most flammable tree. 
because 20% by dry weight, its needles are made up of flammable oils and waxes and resin. It's like setting a match to gasoline. There are 650 species of eucalyptus in Australia. 600 of them are fire adapted. And when they burn, you think, my God, that entire forest is dead. And the following spring, it looks like a green woolly worm as those fire adapted trees put out epicormic sprouting. And within a matter of a few short years, you'd hardly know there is a fire again. Talk about Dick Heddle and his comment about evolution. That eucalyptus is fine in Australia, shouldn't have been planted in the Oakland Hills, because that 1991 tunnel fire killed 25 people. And the Oakland fire killed 25 for a total of 73 civilians. Where do we go from here? We need good fire prevention. Should restore the health of ecosystems where it needs it. We need homeowner responsibility. You folks who live there and through your students, their parents who live there need to step up and assume Governor Schweitzer's challenge to them. Emergency response needs to be good. We got a lot of information. Dick and Sue took us to a website. You can go to firewise.org. There's a ton of information about how to make your property fire safe. In my little fire district at Painted Rocks in the Bitterroot, we're training our residents to prepare. We're urging them to go early. And for those that want to, we're telling them what they have to do if they're physically able to stay and defend a prepared property. Rancho Santa Fe and San Diego County, they've designed six communities from the get-go to be landscaping fire safe and home fire safe. Here's Fire Marshal Cliff Hunter doing a final inspection of the house for the contractors before they turn that house over to the new homeowner. People that buy those homes are told that when there's a chaparral fire, in the hills around these six communities, their safest place is to be in their home. I think this guy, Malcolm Gill, a researcher from Australia, is very interesting. Uh, he said we should shun the following statement that was made by this person, Westgart, in 1888. There, he's saying, essentially, there's never been a fire before, like Black Thursday, 1851. In, in Victoria. <coughs> and most likely, or rather most certainly, it will never, to ex its a frightful extent, occur again. What Malcolm Gill is urging us to do is never say never. They had, as you know, Black Saturday, February 7th, 2009. It was probably far worse than this 1851 fire for a huge variety of reasons. And uh, we don't ever want to say never to another 1910. Because if we did, we drop our vigilance, we drop our guard, and we may pay a horrible price in the future if we're not as prepared as we need to be. Here's what Tim Love said after his trial by fire in Seely Lake in, in 2007 when the Jocko Lake fire was headed his way it's unbelievable. I always predicted, like Biswell predicted for Berkeley Hills, Ron, I always predicted Seely Lake was a town that could go away in a single afternoon due to arcing power lines because there was so much forest fuel and debris right in the middle of Seely Lake. So Tim Love, that great ranger at Seely Lake, it's important that individual landowners take personal responsibility. Here's this guy, a good friend of mine. Who does he look like? Who does he look like? He comes by his conservation ethic honestly. <laughs> I haven't shared this dual image, this twin with Tim, but I intend to. And uh, he's got that same spirit. For those of you who know Tim Roosevelt, uh, Tim Roosevelt, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's call him Tim Roosevelt. Uh, for those of you who know this guy, he's impassioned about good conservation, just like that other, t other guy was, that other T guy. Here's what our governor said. You can read it. I already told you what he said last year and this year. I think he deserves a great commendation for telling it like it is. Too often we've said, oh, the fire department will take care of you to the point that people believe it. 
Fire department isn't going to be in every driveway where our fire is threatening. We have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of threatened homes and, and maybe at the most thousands of engines. No way, unless people take care of themselves, are they going to survive. I think this guy is the county or the city council member, isn't it? Yes. The same David Strohmeyer. I've never met him. I read his book, Drift Smoke. I was captivated, captivated by it. We're going to close with this comment. How many deaths must be offered up on the altar of remorse before we learn some lesson or other about how to be better live in a world that always has, always with, always will, and get this, Dick Huddle and Sue Real, and indeed, always should burn. Might we learn lessons without flag draped caskets? I think so, if we can just remember. This is a fine woman. She's just retired from the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, Tucson, Arizona. This is the mission she put on, the newly founded. Go to that place sometime. sometime. Wildfire Lessons, what is it? Wildfirelessons.net, I think. Or, or just click on Wildfire Lessons Learn. Just as Dick and Sue showed you an unbelievable wealth of information at that earlier website, just Google Wildfire Lessons Learned and you'll get there. And there's an unbelievable wealth of material there. But this is their mission statement. A lesson is truly learned when we modify our behavior to practice what we now know. What a wonderful mission to share with students. In other words, it goes far beyond reading this latest fall textbook, getting to the end of it at the end of the semester, putting it aside and promptly forgetting about it because you have another textbook to learn. Where is the incentive to instill knowledge in students in a way that they will always modify their behavior to practice what they now know. This just popped into my mind like sometimes happens occasionally. I am going to sit down. I'm getting a high sign, I think. I am going to sit down because my stomach's rumbling along with yours. But I'm just going to say this, that um, we need to bring everyone to the table, make lessons so vivid and so personal that we're challenging students to think with the right-hand side of their brain as well as the left-hand side of their brain. That side is equally as important. The intuition and the feelings and the emotions need to be brought to bear on this subject. And I think Dick in his little vignette, he could have gone on for hours, but he wanted to leave the hours to me very, very nicely. But I think it's that right side and left side. It's the integrated brain that we need to bring to bear on these fire issues that Ron and Dick and Sue and I have talked about today. Thank you very much, Doreen. <laughs>